Good. Hello, uh, I'm Adam, um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, Python application uh, building and uh, version control to slightly different topics. But uh, um, we're going to start off with a little bit of um, application building using uh, command line parsing using this um, module called argparse, then get into a little bit about how we can break up um, our different uh, codes into different modules and packages to make things a lot cleaner and neater. Uh, very briefly talk about debugging and testing. I don't have a whole lot about that. And then the second half of the class, I'll be talking about version control, specifically with uh, the uh, Git version control system. So starting off with, uh, with argparse, uh, you should all hopefully uh, have access to this module already. Um, what this allows you to do is simply um, be able to call programs from the command line that you make with Python. So you can just send off this standalone code to anybody and just give them a set of instructions of how to run a particular um, uh, code with it. And you can specify um, certain options uh, in, a, in a nice format here, and uh, it will nicely parse all these uh, different functions for you. So this goal is to just build this standalone code base in Python with command line options and keywords. Um, so this, uh, this module argparse has been built into Python 2.7 and above, uh, also in EPD, so you guys all should probably have it. If you don't, you can just do easy install argparse. Um, and I also had a, uh, um, a sample code that you guys can download from the uh, bspace uh, that we'll go through in a little bit. Um, and also the, the breakout uh, session is on there as well, so if you guys want to go ahead and download that at some point. Um, so this allows for user-friendly command line interfaces, uh, leaves it up to the code to determine what the user wanted. You can be kind of flexible in how you specify these different options, uh, and the code will parse them in a nice way. And it can also automatically generate help uh, messages if you screw up. If you type something that uh, it can't recognize, it'll say, it'll barf and say, I don't, I don't understand what you're trying to say here. Here are your, uh, the options that I'm allowing you to give. Please try again. Uh, there is also a quick note on this uh, this older module that uh, some of you may have seen before called OptParse, uh, which is basically a similar thing, but it's uh, not 100% compatible, and I think it's being edged out in terms of argparse. So the uh, the first step for setting up argparse is to just create a parser object and tell uh, this object what arguments to expect which can then be used to process the uh, command line arguments during the runtime. This parser class is called argument parser, and what this does is just take several arguments uh, to set up the description um, and uh, using the help text of the, the Python program. So just starting off simply here, all you do is import argparse, set up your uh, parser object, using this argument parser class. Uh, and you can give it a little description if you want. And then what we do with our parser object is we go through and we define uh, different arguments that we expect the parser uh, to expect um, and be able to uh, handle. So we use this, uh, this function add argument in the parser class. And there are six different uh, supported actions, which I'll get into on the next slide. And then once you define all these arguments, um, the command line entry is parsed uh, um, by passing a, a sequence of these arguments that you give on the command line to the, the, the parser uh, object. And uh, these will just be taken from the command line by default. So uh, going through the different actions that, uh, that can be defined, there are uh, six built-in actions that can be triggered. Uh, the simplest one is just store. Uh, what this will do is um, if you give it uh, a value, it will just store that value into some variable. And uh, if you want, you can convert it to a different type. So by default, things uh, on the command line are just parse the strings. But you can say, I expect an integer here. Uh, so please try to convert it to an integer. Um, and if it can't convert it to an integer, then it will give you a nice, friendly, helpful error message saying that I can't understand what you're trying to give me. 
another action is store constant. This is slightly different in that uh, this is just a single flag. So if this flag is set, then a constant will be stored um, that's predefined, hard-coded into, uh, into the parser program. Um, store true and store false are just uh, save at the uh, appropriate Boolean value, whether you want this uh, variable to be assigned true or false. Append is a neat one. You can um, save values to a list. Uh, so you can specify several different variables, and they will all be appended to this one um, list function, or list variable. Uh, and similarly to the store constant, you can uh, specify this append constant, um, which will append a bunch of predefined variables within the hard code um, to the list. And finally, version just prints out the current version of the, uh, of the program and then exits. So there's this, uh, this is the file that I uh, uploaded to bspace that we're going to go through one by one to see the, these different uh, argument actions in, in, uh, in practice. Um, so here we went through the, uh, uh, the different steps of importing the argparse module, setting up our parser object, parser equals argparse, argument parser, gave it a description. Uh, and then we added all these different arguments, giving them the flag that we expect from the command line, uh, the action that uh, um, this, uh, this argument is supposed to perform, um, the variable that it's going to be appended to, which is this destination, and a little uh, help string. Josh, do you have a laser pointer by chance? Uh, yeah, so um, store takes the uh, variable that you define in the command line. So, for instance, here uh, the command line would be Python, whatever this file is called, um, minus s to denote that this is the flag I want to parse, and then a, then a value. Uh, so I could do Python uh, code.py minus s uh, variable name. And then the, the string variable name will be stored to the destination simple value. What store constant does is you have a predefined constant here, which is hard coded into the um, into this code base. So all you would set here is this minus c flag. You wouldn't give it a variable afterwards. All you'd say is Python code.py minus c, and then this uh, value store constant would, or sorry, this value uh, value to store would be assigned to the uh, destination constant value. Uh, and we'll go through uh, that, uh, what these different things do. Um, so gone through here and defined a bunch of these different uh, actions. We got the, the store constant. We got the store true and store false, which are the Boolean ones. Append, which appends things to a list. To the destination collection, which is the variable. Um, uh, append constant and uh, minus minus version. <coughs> and then all of these results uh, are in this, uh, we can assign all the results from the parsed um, uh, command into this parser.parseargs um, object. So these go into the results object, and then they are all um, values of this object, all uh, attributes of this object. By defined by their destination. So um, if something was stored with this minus s command, then it will be put in results.simple value. Uh, and then we can print out simple value. Similarly, results.constant value, results.boolean switch, results.collection, and results.constant collection. <coughs> um, and there's also this nice uh, argument help. Whereas if we uh, just specify, so this, uh, this code that I uploaded was called argparseaction.py, which is what we just saw. So if I just do uh, in, uh, on the command line, python argparseaction.py minus h, or minus minus help, um, 
then it will print out all of the different arguments that it can accept and it will give you a little help string that you defined in the code uh, of what, it, what that flag does. So here you see minus s simple value will store the simple value you specify here into this uh, um, uh, variable. So going through these different slides, or these different uh, options here, starting off with store, um, if we give the uh, command line argument python arg parse action dot pi minus s value, what this will do, and then w as you remember at the end of the code we printed out all the different variables that we're storing here. So simple value uh, gets uh, the value, the string value value gets stored to simple value. We didn't do anything with the um, with the variable constant value, so that's still none. Boolean switch was defined to be false by default. Collection is still empty, and constant collection is still empty. Um, so going on to store constant to delineate the difference between this and store. Uh, here we just give it the flag minus c. And what will this do? So this. <laughs> Simple value is none because we haven't defined that. Um, so what will the uh, destination constant value be stored as? If I just gave it the flag minus C, uh, <coughs> the constant value to store is hard-coded as the constant that we uh, want to store to this destination. So as we go to the next line, constant value C, the uh, um, value has been assigned value to store. Does that make sense? And that can be anything. That doesn't have to be a string. No, that can be anything. Number, it can be a list. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So it already knows the value that you're asking it to store. Yeah, that's hard coded. So this is something like, uh, I don't know, if you want, if there's for some reason you want to have a flag that this flag will only do one thing and will only say like, uh, I don't know, like if if there's a string that is later used in your code um, and you want to be able to, to have a flag saying please assign this string to this value or this, this number to this value, uh, then this will just allow you to do it with a simple flag rather than uh, having to input the value you want. So this is something like if you, the coder, knows uh, know that um, there's only one value that makes sense for this particular variable, then you can uh, set it up this way. And yeah, going back to, to Josh's point that we can specify what we want, uh, it would be, there's a, there's a flag here, like, I think it's called type, where you can uh, specify whether you want it to be an int or a float or a string or something. By default, it's just a string. Yeah, I can imagine maybe making it a bunch of default values. Uh, for for the, for what? Like if you say minus C, then it loads all the default values. Oh, for the constant store. Constant for this guy. Yeah, you can you can as uh, well. This one it, it expects that you give it a string input. Okay. Um, so if you look back at the help file, it would say uh, to run this, you do Python program dot pi minus s. Uh, and then type a string. And then it will try to parse that string and assign it to this value, uh, this variable simple value. Or you can retype it within uh, an argument, right? Like you have to type it a string within the memory, but it has the string. Correct. Like can, if you type a number and you say convert this to a flow, then add argument, it'll do that, right? Yep. And if it can't convert it, then it'll, I think it'll give you a nice error message saying, I don't understand that input. I expected an uh, integer. <coughs> uh, okay, so store true, store false. These are just Boolean switches. Here we see we can give it a default value if we want. So here the default is false. Um, and uh, so if we set this flag minus t, then it will change this Boolean value to true. 
So you see the Boolean switch is now being printed out as true. Um, append, this can take uh, a series of um, entries on the command line, and then it will append all of them onto a particular list. So these will all go to the list collection. So here our command line input is python r parse action.py minus a1 minus a2 minus a3. So then these uh, strings 1, 2, and 3 will all be appended to this list collection. So when we print out the list at the end here, um, you see that they have all been assigned to this collection list. And similarly, append constant um, here we define hard-coded what the different values that we can append are. So again, these are just single flags. We can't specify a variable afterwards. Uh, um, and these will append these uh, different predefined constant values to uh, um, a list. So here we can do python arc parse action.py minus b minus a, and then this will append the predefined constants to this constant collection list. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, I think it'll do that. And finally, uh, you can specify this version flag, uh, which will just print out a, the current version of your code. So you can update, if you update your code and send out someone else, or send a new version to someone, you can say that this is version 2.0 or 2.1 or whatever you want. Uh, so that's, uh, that's arg parse stuff. Does anyone have any um, questions on this? We're going to be going into a breakout session where you'll be able to uh, um, to deal with all these different things uh, and try it out for yourself. I think it's also worth pointing out the nargs uh, keyword. So you can set nargs equals to a number, like two, which basically, is, let's say you want to put a latitude longitude and you want to say minus minus position. And you want to force them to have to do two numbers after that. You can say nargs equals two, and then it'll, it'll save that. Um, you can also do nargs equals question mark, and then Okay. Um, so now we're going on to uh, modules and packages. Um, this is a nice way of um, being able to better organize your code once your code starts to becoming large and unwieldy um, because you just can't keep everything in just single standalone um, uh, code files all the time, you're eventually going to want to be able to have all your code communicate with each other nicely um, and uh, put things in different folders to make sense based on, say, I want to group all my code into a bunch of plotting stuff and then I group another block of code into um, some other thing that we're doing with, uh, with databases or something like that. Uh, and then we can communicate back and forth between all our different code bases uh, in a nice, uh, easy-to-use format. 
So you have functions from other codes made for different reasons, might be usable elsewhere. So say we make a plotting code for one thing, and then we eventually start doing another project, and we realize that the plotting code that we wrote for our old project could be used for this new project. Then we can call that, that module and be able to, to reuse it over and over again. So it's useful to break up our code into modules and packages, whereas a module is just a, uh, a file containing uh, predefined functions and variables. Uh, and it must just have a .py extension. So, I mean, this is similar to, to uh, what we've been doing all along with uh, the uh, Python stand, uh, standard library. So we can import these modules just by saying, you know, import uh, plotting or, well, we've done everything with matplotlib and whatnot. So you do import matplotlib or from matplotlib import pyplot. Uh, these are just instances of, of functions within modules um, that we can import to our, our, uh, our code base. <coughs> so, um, in order for, for these modules to be able to be called correctly, we need to set up our, our, uh, our paths correctly so that uh, if we're trying to call our different modules that we've created from uh, anywhere else on our computer, if we're not in the right folder, uh, we need to know, Python needs to know where to look for your code base. Uh, so you go, you have to set up your, your Python path uh, in your environment variables um, so that Python knows where to look for your code base. Um, so I'm not going to go through all this, but you can read this as a, at your leisure. You basically just need to set this uh, uh, Python path um, environment variable uh, to the correct path to where your code lives. Um, so if you have a bunch of Python code in uh, this directory path to your code, uh, then you just set this as your Python path, and then you're, you'll be able to, when you initiate a, um, a uh, instance of Python, be able to import all of the, the different code that you've written in a nice, easy way. Um, and you can also check all this within Python uh, and append to your path if you want to do this on the fly within Python. Probably won't need to do this very often, but you can at least check to make sure if, if you're getting path on, uh, errors or something like that, you can check to, to make sure that your path is set correctly within Python to see where it is looking for your particular path. So if you import this sys module um, and then print sys.path, it will uh, list all of the places that Python is currently looking for code um, to, uh, to find all the modules and functions that you've predefined. So here there's uh, um, two different paths set here, um, which I've called predefined Python path and path defined by environment variable. So these are, it, it will list all the ones that are pre-built into Python where it's looking within its own structure, and then also the ones that you've, you've defined by yourself. You can also append this list if, you're, uh, um, if you want to add a new path uh, within, your, uh, within this current instance of Python. You can just basically just add to this list, and then this will be um, added to your path. But uh, this goes away once you close down Python for this instance. So if you want something to be permanently within your Python path, you'll want to set it up as your environment variable. <coughs> one other thing about that. Yeah, of course. Um, the thing to also recognize is that you may have a, a code that you're writing called, you know, I code for my lab, and that's got its own sort of set of directories. In the codes that you run, you may want to uh, not sort of modify the Python path directly, but you might want to uh, look at an environment variable called my big code base or something, and then append inside of Python, um, you know, something that uh, uses that as a stem so that you now have, you actually tell Python while you're running, oh, and by the way, I have another code base which I want you to look at. You may not want to have to directly hard code your Python path to add all of the different things that you're going to be uh, building and running. You may want to do that with a separate code. Great. 
Uh, so now, briefly, briefly on the packages, um, if you have this path all set correctly, then your code can be broken up even further into reasonable folders and imported as necessary. Uh, you can either import all of the modules within, within, a, um, within a package or functions or classes within the modules. Um, and really all you need to do for this is just break up your code into separate folders. Uh, say you have an analysis folder uh, with two different, func um, two different modules, data cleaner and data generator. Um, and, and then you have a, also a plotting uh, module with different uh, uh, modules, histogram and scatterplot. All you need to do is just place a blank, like nothing in it, just underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, dot pi within that folder, and then you'll be able to import uh, different functions in, uh, from these different modules within that folder. So if we want to import all of the different functions from this file data generator, uh, all we need to do is do import analysis, which is the name of our, our module, um, our package for analysis. Uh, dot data generator, which is the name of uh, this file, uh, and then we can shorten it if we want as DG. Uh, and there's also say there's a function nice nice hist within this histogram dot pi um, uh, program, then we can just import that individual function uh, if we want from plotting dot histogram import nice hist. Uh, and then we can call all of these different um, uh, functions that we've imported uh, with the example my data equals dg.generateData, where generate data is a function within the uh, data generator program. And then we can do nice as my data. So this is just a nice way to break up your code into a bunch of different packages for um, cleaner use. Um, and very briefly, there's a, uh, I won't go too much into this, but there's a, um, a uh, way called this utils to package up your, um, all of your code base into a nice uh, format for, uh, to bundle it up and, and for easy use by others. Um, you can just create a setup.py file using these disk details things, which allows others to install your code in the standard fashion where they just do uh, Python setup.py, and then it will install all of your code base uh, together. This is a bit more complicated than anything I want to get into, but I uh, just wanted to throw that name out there uh, so you guys could look into it if you want to. Do you have anything more to say about disk utils, Josh? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, briefly about debugging and testing. Um, this uh, standard technique, or maybe not standard, but the technique some people use to debug code by inserting a bunch of print statements inside your code to see what's going wrong can be inconvenient if your code takes a long time to run. Uh, so there's this uh, module PDB, which is an interactive source debugger, uh, which allows you to step through all the different uh, parts of your code and see what's happening at every given step. And variables are preserved at uh, each breakpoint, and you can step through lines of code and see what variable is assigned at what place uh, to um, see what really is going on within your code. Um, and this is especially easy with NIPython, because if your code crashes and it gives you a nice, uh, it spits out a nice error message, and you can just type out debu uh, type debug, and it will set you into this uh, IPDB environment where you can step through and see what the, um, what the code is doing wrong. Uh, so I think I might want to give a little demo on this, um, just to briefly go.
this so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I was just going to put a, uh, um, an error in the code so it'll crash and then try to step through and see where it crashed. Uh, but I realize this might not be the best one to do for this. So, um, file. so Fernando's, um, instead of doing print statement statement, is to put a 1 divided by 0 in places he would have put print statements. Oh, really? I just raised exceptions. Yeah, so he raised, it raises a uh, you know, numerical error exception. And that's his way of doing the inspection into his code when he breaks. When he knows it's breaking around there. Right. Uh, so. Save this as So all this code is doing is uh, um, let me just do print here. Taking these two variables and then trying to convert them into integers and then printing them. So I got a value error here. Um, invalid literal for int with base 10 hello. Uh, so all this is telling me that uh, I don't understand this variable. Um, uh, this int string is crashing. I can't, um, I can't do this action. So if I do debug, then it'll bring, this, bring me into this IPDB environment, and I can see what the different values that are stored in this environment are. Uh, sorry, in my code are. So I can type just print string or print uh, number string. Why is that not there? Oh, because that. Oh, yeah, maybe. Run. There we go. So I can go through these different variables and see what they are. So I can see that uh, number string is assigned to variable 5, uh, which Python will be able to handle and turn into an integer. But it can't turn this integer string into, uh, sorry, can't turn this string hello into an integer. So we can see that's why it's crashing. I will just go back to my code and get rid of this. Exit out of IPDB. Uh, with just control D, and then I can do this, and it will print and run correctly. So Adam, yeah. Uh, even if you don't go into debug mode, you can still have IPython tell you what the most variables. Oh yeah, how's that? You can just query it, stuff that you run, that you then have access to, but it can't go into the functions. Okay, that's probably. Yes. Def. Yeah. 
write. So <clears throat> going back and making the code crappy again, assigning our variables here. So I do run untitled.py um, and sorry, import um, import untitled. Yeah, this this will work. Um, untitled dot. Uh, oh right, I've got to call it in here. <laughs> right. There we go. Untitled dot. I've got to reload here. Okay, and now entitled dot assign and print. There we go. Now debug. Um, so yes, we are here uh, within the uh, the print stuff um, function. And we can also go up and down to go through the different functions with U and D to see where in the different lines of code these things are being um, uh, assigned. Does that make sense? So it allows you, if, especially if you have a really complex code that's calling tons of different functions, you can step up and down through all the different parts of the code and see where exactly a particular variable is being assigned. So if I, since I stepped up here, I see that the string hello is being assigned within this assign and print uh, function. Uh, sorry, within this uh, um, print stuff function. No, it's being, a, it's being assigned in the assign and print function and then being printed in the print stuff function. So I can either go back and change the string to something else, reload it, and then print. It'll work fine. So that just allows a nice, easy way to, to go back and, and debug your code on the fly. OK. So now I was going to have a, a breakout session. Um, so uh, did you guys able to access the, the breakout.zip? OK. So there's this um, file breakout10.zip. Uh, and within this, um, once you unzip it, there's a uh, couple directories and also a function. Um, there's also a file called breakout10.py, which is currently empty. Uh, and uh, what I want you to do here is not to modify the other files in the other folders, uh, but you will need to use them. So you'll want to uh, use the, the modules and packages stuff that I talked about before um, to be able to import stuff from these different folders uh, in order to, to run the breakout10.py. And then um, want to build up a command line parser, which allows the user to specify uh, how many data points to generate. So there's a, uh, there's a function called, uh, well there, there one of the folders has a data generator fun, um, file. And then it also, one of the other folders uh, is plotting, and you'll be able to define what to, uh, how you want to plot it. So basically, I want this command line parser to be able to specify how many data points you want to generate. Uh, down here, you see the, the flag minus n200. So that's saying I want to generate 200 data points. Um, and then there's this flag minus t, which will say whether I want it to be plotting a uh, filled-in histogram or an outlined one, uh, and also be able to specify the title of the plot with this minus capital T flag, and then have the plot to be generated. Make sense? 
Okay? Have fun. So I'm just going to go really quickly um, over what the answer should look like here. Um, so to start off, uh, because we had this uh, breakout 10 folder, uh, and we had our file breakout10.py and these two subfolders, data gen and plotting. Can get rid of these. Um, so you see, in order to be able to import data gen and plotting into my breakout10.py, I had to put this underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi into each of these folders. Uh, and then I built up the breakout10.py, which imported these things. Um, and I'll go through this line by line in a sec, but I just want to demonstrate that this works. Hopefully. So if I do um, Python breakout 10.py minus minus help, I'll get a nice friendly help message, maybe. Hello. There we go. Um, saying how to use the code and what all the different arguments are. So we see that I have uh, this flag minus t, which if I uh, flag this, it'll uh, be true to use the unfilled histogram. Uh, if it's minus f, then do not use the minus or do not use the unfilled histogram. Minus n and the variable data n will uh, store the number of data points to retrieve from our data generator function. And then this minus capital T title will store the title for the plot. So if I do this command python breakout10.py minus t, so this will be an unfilled histogram, minus n 200, so I'll get 200 data points, and then minus t my awesome title, um, and you see I had to put this in strings because, uh, or sorry, in quotes, because otherwise it would take it as three different arguments. Um, then press enter, and I should hopefully get a nice unfilled histogram of random data with the title, my awesome title. Let's see if I add a minus f at the end. See if Chris was right, that will take the last one. Yep. So even though I had the minus t and minus f, it'll take the last uh, last flag that you give it. Let's see if I give it a um, uh, an um, argument that I didn't specify I could take. It crashes and says unrecognized argument minus g, and then gives me a little nice little um, instruction again of how to actually use the code. It's not actually crashing, it's just exiting. And that's the way that it, the default exit is. Sure. But you can, again, you can overwrite that. You could have it email your parents if you want. <laughs> <laughs> should do that for your homework. Every time your code crashes in. Yeah. Okay, back to off mirroring. Okay, so yes, here's going through the, the code that I did to, to achieve this. Um, uh, I placed those blank in it .py files in the data gen and plotting folders, and then I want to uh, import the, uh, the function ran data from the data gen dot generate data module, and then import the outlined histogram from the plotting dot hist outline uh, module. So now I have those tools at my disposal from those different folders. Everything is communicating nicely. Uh, and I also import the regular histogram, import arg parse, import pylab for plotting purposes, set up my parser, add the argument minus t, which will um, 
store true. This is a binary switch. Uh, unfilled histogram to true uh, with the minus F flag. It will set unfilled histogram to false. Um, the minus N is just a simple store action. Uh, you can set a default. Uh, here I have as a default of 10 data points. Uh, send it to the destination data N. Uh, and you see that I specified the type as integer. So it'll try to um, uh, convert it into an integer. And then here's another store action, minus T, uh, with the default no title, the destination title. Take all the results from the parser into the results uh, object. Um, then I get my data. Uh, from the function ran data, feeding to it the results.data n from the parser, which is just the number of data points I want. Then if results.unfilled histogram equals true, then we do the unfilled histogram plot. Otherwise, we do the regular histogram plot. Make sense? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. So let's do that. Oops, I still have that bad one. Oh, sorry, thanks. Yep, so there's just 10 data points there. And also, since it's trying to convert it into a, uh, a number, um, if I feed it something that it can't convert into an int, then it should just exit with a nice error message. Invalid int file, blah. Are you within the, yeah, I didn't change my path. I just did this all within the, fi the, f um, the directory that breakout10.py was in. And you're still getting, OK. Well, that happens. Let's do, do another one of these. That's sad. Google provides services with a wide range of devices from desktop computers to mobile devices, including tablets. But we've long neglected one of the most popular computer systems ever sold. And I'm here to introduce Google Maps 8-bit version as a first product for NES. <laughs> well, first we take a look at a new type of cartridge with dialog technology, allowing the NES to connect to Google. We run more than 100,000 servers to overcome the NES's technical limitations. 8-bit maps are generated by Google's cloud in real time. It's really easy to use. Insert the cartridge, connect the cable, and turn the power on. Load the cartridge to the start, and you're automatically connected to the internet. Let's surf on the title screen. Select search and enter the name of the just like the regular Google Maps. You can of course search a route to your destination. Google Maps AP version 
is soon be available in Google Store. But for now, you can play the trial version by going to Google Maps and click the Quest button on the top right corner. <laughs> Okay, now let's again. Um, so the goals of this talk, you guys have, uh, or many of you at least may have seen uh, Git introduced um, at the boot camp, and I'm sure some of you already use some kind of version control, uh, but I think it'll be worthwhile to go through this again, especially for those that, that aren't actively using uh, version control in their everyday lives. Uh, so if you're not using version control, I should hopefully convince you that all of you should start using version control now uh, and give a little cookbook method of how to use a very specific uh, set of Git-centric tools to get started and then point in the right direction for more use. So going back to this, uh, this video game analogy, say we want to uh, uh, play Google 8-bit version. Uh, in the very old school state of video games, there were no save slots. And uh, if you died, that was just game over. Um, so that sucked. You had to start all over again. Um, then uh, we eventually got to one save slot, uh, but uh, there were um, pitfalls of this. Like, what if we wanted to go back to a previous save state? What if we wanted to revisit a, 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 a special um, part of our game that we want to revisit over and over again? Or go down a different uh, a path that we could take? Or worse, what if the game is unwinnable? What if we go down uh, some dungeon that we can't escape from, and then we save our game, and then we can't, uh, we can't go back and, uh, uh, and fix it? Um, but then comes new technology. We get uh, video games with multiple frequent saves, security, which gives us security to avoid lost progress, and uh, the ability to return to earlier states and choose to go down new paths. Um, so this is kind of the mentality that we want. Does anyone recognize this game? Is that, is it? Could be, okay. Is that Half-Life 2? Okay. That looks like my cubicle? <laughs> this is the game of life. So yes, it, it saves it uh, very often, uh, and uh, this is a mentality that we want. We want to save early and save often, and have all of our previous save states um, available for us to go back. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, um, the kind of idea for version control. Uh, it allows us to have a management of, uh, of all the changes to the programs that we make to documents and other computer files. Um, gives us all these different checkpoints of the evolution of the source code. So if we, go, if we have a particular place where we want to branch off and explore new, new routes with our code, we can do so, keeping all the old code the same. Uh, it's also a nice way to, to back up, store, um, uh, restore, and synchronize all of our code. Uh, see what the different changes in the history of the code was, um, and uh, uh, also allow for um, collaboration on a single code base with multiple users, uh, and finally to maintain sanity. Uh, so here's a nice little plot illustrating this. We have this uh, uh, code quality per development per hour, which I got from Peter Williams, a grad student in our department. Um, as time goes on, we want to be able to feel free to experiment without fear of breaking our existing code. Here's a very embarrassing slide of what I used to do for primitive version control. Uh, I basically just saved uh, a bunch of different uh, instances of the same code over and over again, keeping just calling it a different letter each time. So this way, I, I maintained the uh, ability to go back to an old version of my code if I wanted to. Uh, but it uh, quickly was uh, spiraling out of control as I made lots of different changes. Um, so, huh? This was my undergrad. Don't worry. This was before, before I saw the light. <laughs> I also had some Fortran in there. It was even worse. 
So we want to avoid that. I mean, that's still better than nothing, but we want to be able to do this in a, in a better way. Uh, so right now I'm going to uh, go through a bunch of terms that uh, are commonly used in um, version control, specifically with Git. Um, so we have this uh, repository or repo, which is this sort of central database that's storing all the versions of the files uh, and also keeping track of all their changes. So this, this repo contains all of the past versions of your files um, and notes all the different changes that were made between them. There's a server, which is the computer storing this repository. A client is the computer connecting to the repository. Uh, a working copy is a local directory um, of this repository where we make all the different changes to our, our files. Uh, and this word trunk is the primary location for all the code in the repository. Um, now some different actions we can do. Uh, add is to begin tracking a file by just putting it into the repository. Uh, we do that in a in special way. Uh, revision is the current version of a file, whether it's version 1, 2, etc. Um, and the latest of these revisions is called the head. Um, and to do this action called checkout is to download a file or files from this repository. So if we want to check out a particular file or a particular bunch of files from a repository, we do something called a checkout. To check in or to commit is to, after we've made changes to the file, we want to upload the uh, change file to the repository um, and uh, give a nice little commit message saying what we've changed. Um, we can do an update or sync, which will basically swap the different files and make sure that we have the, the current repository uh, updated um, and meshing nicely with our current uh, working directory. And there's also revert, uh, which we say, screw it, I don't like anything that I've done, I'm going to revert back to the repository state and get rid of all my changes that I've made locally. Um, some more uh, advanced terms or things that you can do are uh, to branch. Um, so what this is kind of going down a different path, say a different, uh, going down a different cave in, in your video game. Uh, we basically create a separate copy of a file or folder for private use and then we can uh, go experiment with it and uh, play around with it and see if uh, we want to um, develop or commit the changes after the fact. Uh, we can find the differences between two files using the diff command to see what has changed between two revisions. Um, merge or patch to apply the changes from one file to another, bringing it up to date. Um, conflict, obviously, is when changes contradict each other. Uh, this can sometimes happen when you're working with another person on the code and uh, you both try to edit the same part of the code. Um, it will uh, and then if you try to merge those things together, it will, it will create a conflict saying, I can't merge these, you've tried to edit the same part. Uh, and then if this happens, you'll have to resolve the, the conflict. <coughs> so there are two uh, main breakdowns of uh, different types of, of uh, um, version control systems. Uh, there's centralized um, and distributed. Centralized code uh, version control systems are like SVN, uh, what else, CVS, I think was centralized. And then distributed are sort of newer ones uh, uh, like Git and Mercurial. Uh, so with the centralized ones, we have all of the revisions existing on a single server. So we have this uh, this nice computer somewhere that we uh, uh, contain that contains all the different revisions that have ever been made to this code, and then uh, any user that wants to access this code will have to check out a particular version, make changes to it, and then commit the changes back to the central server. And so that all that exists on the user's uh, computer is just the current version of things. Um, so with this requires is that you have communication with the central server at all times if you want to be able to commit new changes or pull back uh, um, other changes that other people have made. Uh, you just basically need to uh, have communication with the central server. Um, with a distributed uh, framework, you clone the entire repository. So you take 
everything and put it onto your local machine. Um, so on your local machine, you have all the different history of everything that has been done to that repository. Uh, and you basically just have everything at your disposal locally. Um, so you don't really need communication with a central server since everything is local. Uh, so you can, you know, make changes and commit changes to your local repository while you're flying on a plane and you have no internet access. Um, and then later on, if you want to be able to push to a central repository so other people can access your code, uh, you can still do that with, you, with these push and pull actions to pull to and from a central repository somewhere. But it's not necessary. You can do everything locally if you want, which is really nice. These are just illustrations of this. Um, I don't really go through these. Uh, but uh, <coughs> so there are, I think, in my opinion at least, and I think in a lot of other people's opinions. I used to use uh, uh, SVN, but uh, which was a central repository, um, a centralized uh, VCS system. But I quickly got turned over to Git because it's got these advantages of a, of a distributed version control system. Uh, with centralized, history modification is, uh, is difficult. It's hard to go back and, and change history should you want to. Um, uh, and uh, as I said before, you require net network communication at all times if you want to do any actions. Um, and because of this network communication, everything is a lot slower. Uh, but with, with a distributed version control system like Git, everything, is, uh, everything can be local and everything is a lot faster because of it. This is a list of a few different brands of version control systems. Um, CVS uh, back in the 90s, a version which is what I used to use, SVN. Uh, and then a bunch of these new ones came out around 2005. Um, and the one I'm going to be talking about today is, is Git. Where did that name come from? Does anyone know? It's pretty awesome. So. I'm um, going to, what's that? Get getting started. Get, getting started. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Do you know why he named it that, though? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, oh, what? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so now we can just go through different steps of, uh, of Git. Uh, you should hopefully all uh, have it on your computers now so you can kind of follow along with this um, uh, as, we, uh, as we go. Uh, version control of your files is very easy to start up uh, locally. All you need to do is initialize a repository, so you go into a particular folder that you want to start version control in. Uh, add some files to it, and then commit changes. So we can start off by just going into a folder we call My Software, uh, which we now want to um, start uh, putting under version control. We initialize the repository uh, using the command git init. And that should print out a... Uh, um, nice little message saying that uh, the initialization was successful. But if we do ls minus a in that repository, you should see that uh, this file dot git has been um, created uh, along with all your other files that you may already have in that directory. Um, so uh, that is what keeps track of all the different history. This is, uh, I think, a folder of all the different history uh, and modifications and such, and all of the past versions of the code that uh, have been uh, created under this, uh, this repository. Uh, so if you don't have any files in this folder yet, go ahead and, and add a few files in there so we can add them. Um, uh, and then if you want to just add all of your current files into, um, 
all the current files into my software directory. Then we can just do git add dot, which will just add everything that's in that directory to. Um, no, you need to specify that you want this particular file to start being version controlled. So if you just have a, uh, if you have a file in there that you didn't do git add to, uh, then it will just stay as a normal file. It won't be version controlled. Anything, any changes you make to it won't be tracked. Uh, so you need to, uh, to add it as you go along. If you, if you create a new file, you need to do git add to that file. Um, and then you do git commit minus m. The minus m is uh, to give the, the message of what you've changed. Uh, so you do git commit minus m, and this is just uh, the message initial import of all my files. And then it prints out a nice little message of all that. Did people get that to work? Are there any problems with that? Yeah? Yeah, no, no, sure. Uh, so add is, uh, um, it is a type of change that is to be made. So I, I say git add um, file.py. Uh, that means I want file.py to start being uh, handled under version control. And so that is a change that I've made. And then if I want to commit that change, then I need to do git commit minus m, um, and then the string added file.py. Uh, and then, so the commit, uh, is what you do after every change that you make. So then if I were to go into file.py and add a few lines of code, um, then I would do uh, git commit minus m and the message added some lines of code. And hopefully a more descriptive message than about what that, those lines of code do, but, but that's the idea. So the, the, there's the actions, uh, uh, the action commit is to commit any changes that you've made to any files in that directory or the addition of new files to that directory. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if you're sort of adding a file, you make a new file and you realize you want it to be in your repository, you add two more, So the basic workflow is, a, I mean, it's just very nice and easy. You modify your code and document, you commit changes, and then you repeat. It's really all there is to it for a, a very basic workflow of Git. You don't have to specify which file you want to commit changes to. You can. If you, uh, yeah. So you can, if you only want, if, let's say you've made tri uh, changes to file A and file B, um, and you only want to commit the changes to file B, then you do git commit uh, B. Uh, say it was b.py, and then minus m uh, text message of what you've changed to file b. Uh, so that will leave all the changes that you made to file a uncommitted for you to commit at some later date. Oh yeah, I, I'm just going to go into uh, graphical user interfaces at some point. I've not used Git GUI, but uh, um, but yeah, I'll give a demonstration. All these, uh, unless you really like using command lines, all this can be done a lot easier with a, with the GUI. <laughs> but uh, I think it's useful to go through the, the, the basics of the command lines at, uh, at the beginning. So yeah, uh, going through the, uh, we can go through the, some of the different actions that we can do here. Um, starting off with, with the add uh, action. Uh, so. I'm creating this, uh, this file readme uh, on the command line uh, echo. This is the readme, pipe it into the readme file. And now I want to add this readme file to start being version controlled. So I do git add readme. So this is saying, instead of doing everything that has changed, I specify that I want uh, um, just to add this particular file. And then git commit minus m added a readme file. And now that has been filed. Uh, now that it has been committed, I can also remove a file from. Do you have a question? Yeah. So you, in the top, you then change readme again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you need to either add it again or use dash a to change? No. Uh, no. 
Then you just do git commit uh, readme minus m. Okay. So I just said git commit dash m like chain readme again, but didn't say git commit readme, but it not in commit. I think you'd yeah, I think you'd need to uh, specify what file you want to commit. Or use dash a. Or use dash a, yeah. Okay. That's the difference. Yeah. Because if you use dash a then it'll do all the changes. Okay. And you don't do that way to tell but Yeah. Okay. So the opposite of this, if I wanted to uh, uh, delete a file from being version controlled, I can do git remove, git rm useless file.txt, or a recursive remove of a, of a directory, git remove minus r. Kind of annoying, but if you want to rename a file, uh, then you need to sort of do a, uh, uh, it, it sort of does a, a delete uh, of the file and then adds it again. Um, but you can shorten this with just the git move command. Um, I think I think uh, I think the the move is exactly the same, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But I think it is actually the same as just adding and deleting in terms of how it logs it or whatever. So all of these uh, commits that you have made um, are identifiable by um, a, uh, these things called sh1 hashes. So there's these long string of numbers uh, and letters that uh, identify each of these particular commits. Um, so if you do the command git log, you will get all of the recent uh, commits that have been, uh, all the recent changes that have been committed to the repository along with a, a message about them. So you get the commit uh, uh, hashtag, um, the author who did the command, uh, who did the committing, um, the date, and the, the comment that they associated with it. Um, so, <coughs> we can uh, go through um, and see what the current status of our repository is by doing git status. Um, this will s let us know if any changes to uh, particular files have been um, made or if uh, files have been added but not yet committed. So this uh, git status command will say, um, you know, you have made changes to, to file x and file y, you have added file z, uh, but uh, they have not been committed yet. Um, you can also, so that will let you know what, what files have yet to be committed so you can uh, um, do that. Uh, there's also git diff, which is uh, a way on the command line to see the differences between your current working copy of a file and the file that you got from the repository. So you can see what changes that you had made. Uh, so here we see, uh, after I git um, git diff of this file mystuff.py, we see that I have uh, removed this, this line and added these lines. However, uh, as I said, unless you really like working from the command line, there are GUI tools which make this process a lot easier. Um, and uh, uh, the one I have used and uh, had a lot of success with is, uh, is Smart Git, uh, but I'm sure there's many others that some people might be able to recommend to you. I gave a link to a, a, a bunch of different uh, um, GUI interfaces that you could download, but I found Smart Git to be pretty good. I think it, it works on Mac, Linux, and Windows, uh, so um, it's pretty flexible in terms of that. Uh, so I was going to go through a little uh, uh, demo now of uh, um, how to use Smart Git for doing the things that we were we were talking about.
huge. Hmm? Yes, market runs on Mac. And uh, and everything. Yeah. Did that work? Okay. Anyway, um, so here you see my my base. Um, Directory is uh, this Q repo directory, and I have it within it, uh, within it a bunch of different uh, folders. You can also uh, put papers and stuff under version control. Um, but here, let's go through some of my software directories. Uh, as you can see, I treat all these different directories as modules. I got the init.py in there, um, so I can uh, easily communicate all my different code back and forth between them. Um, Within, uh, within SmartGit, I can um, pull up a log to see what uh, different changes have been made to a particular file and when. Um, so here I have uh, the commit messages for each of the different uh, commits that I made to this uh, particular file. And you can also scroll through and uh, they have a little um, uh, Difference, differencing thing here that shows what uh, what changes have been made between these two different versions. So looks here like I just modified a couple keywords and added a few lines of code there. So let's say I want to uh, open up this file and make some changes to it. And then save that. Close it. And then SmartGit will notice that uh, this file has changed. Uh, it'll show up as a little orange picture here saying that this file has changed and uh, needs to be committed. So if I want to see what I changed, if I uh, am not uh, uh, quick with my commit, I can go ahead and change this and see what I actually changed here. This pulls up an, a little um, GUI uh, showing the differences between the file that I got from the repository and my local copy. Uh, so you can see it just shows here that I added a nice comment here. So that's fine. Uh, now I want to commit this file. So I just click commit. Um, and then hit commit. And there we go. Everything is uh, is committed, and we see that my uh, sorry, where's that? Oh, that just uh, uh, this is the index state. I don't know. Did did that show up as change when I changed grid plot? That might be, uh, is that if uh, the repository version has changed? Uh, no? I don't know. I'm not sure what the next state is. Right, there's a... Uh, there's a file that you can specify within your Git repository. Um, called ignore. Right. So there's this git ignore file that if you put if you put this in your main Git repository, this will say, I don't want to uh, ever worry about any of these types of files. Uh, so, I never want to be able to commit a .pyc file because that's just, you know, compiled whatever. Uh, bibliography files, building files. Uh, I also uh, want to ignore some of these image files that uh, constantly be created. Um, this uh, just allows me to say that these files are unimportant to me and I don't want them to be version controlled. 
So if you put this .git ignore file in your um, main directory for your uh, where the version control is happening, then you can ignore all those different types of files. So I usually do the same thing. I ignore all of my data files. Is there a good way to carry around the data files if you want? I want to do my repository for something else. I definitely don't want the data files to be version control because then there's going to be awful and huge in that place. Uh -huh. um, how do you guys normally pass around the data? Do you just have a separate directory for them? Very good question. <laughs> it would be really nice if I could add it to get in a way that does a version control. Like, I want yeah. to be a question. I want to be able to like, have it kind of carry along, but definitely never version control. Yeah, so you just don't have all the different copies of the file? Well, just don't commit any changes. Yeah, but what if you do well, make changes to it? So we have, you know, I'm using some, you know, GitHub or some other repository. I want other people to be able to download my data files. So the way I, I do it right now is I just separately completely and send it back to all the data. Yeah, I mean, this is a very uh, hot topic. Okay, I'm trying to understand how to do this right and robustly and where you're not unnecessarily moving data around. But by, 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 the, by the nature of what you're asking, It's not ridiculous to think about that we may actually go that direction. Um, but likely what you want to do is you want to basically have a big file called, you know, execute this if you want the code. And then I mean, uh, the, the data, and then it actually goes to some central repository and pulls the data for the person locally. I think that's even all this system. There's something where I have my data on my computer. I just give somebody else, you know, a bundle of my repository. And I give them my data directly. So I would just have a code to do it. Or right now I have a special box where I push it. And I also like it. Yeah, I don't know what I want. Yeah. Yes. No, no, it's not a solved problem. Okay. And, 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 but it, and so any sort of hybridization of something you're already doing is, is probably the best way to do it in its own way. Yeah, I particularly get into problems with that when doing shared papers and stuff, because those images can get out of control too. Like when you when you make a lot of changes to uh, you know, uh, any image files or EPS files or something like that. You don't want to, I mean, you're constantly making changes to them, but you don't want every version of that file to be saved because <laughs> then you just get huge repositories. Can you set user permissions for who can commit specific files? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can say you can do Does that? Yeah, I use Gitolite as well, but I don't know if you can specify what files or just what folders. Yeah. Right. All right, let's just have one or more of these. <laughs> Where's going on? Since our founding in 2005, we at YouTube have continually strived to bring you the best possible video experience on the internet. But that is all about to change. Our latest innovation gives you a way to literally hold YouTube in your hand. Introducing the YouTube Collection on DVD. It's the complete YouTube experience, completely offline. Enjoying YouTube videos has never been easier. With the YouTube Collection, DVDs have been completely organized into a system of massive modules. Simply navigate through the modules until you find the DVD of your choice. <laughs> Each DVD menu is populated with video content. Just like on YouTube.com, you can select your playback resolution. And yes, full screen mode is available if desired. The YouTube collection doesn't require the internet, you don't lose interactivity. Just fill out the comment form and place it in one of the self addressed standard documents. <laughs> don't forget to throw in a green thumbs up or a red thumbs down. Your feedback will be sent directly <laughs> to the leader of that particular video. So you can maintain the dialogue that you're used to. The YouTube collection isn't just a sample of YouTube, it's all of YouTube. Every YouTube video uploaded ever. As soon as you sign up, we'll dispatch a fleet of 175 YouTube trucks to your home. Your nested video modules will arrive.
<laughs> Reminds me of a uh, Gmail paper the, a couple of years ago. Was that last year? That was, last year. was that last year? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they had a lot this year. I think there were several others, <laughs> like Google Racing. That was cool. Yeah. That wasn't real? Should be. Oops. Self driving cars are real. Okay, uh, now on to collaboration. Uh, so, um, Git makes it, uh, or any version control system, makes it really easy to work on a single code base or document with multiple people contributing. Or similarly, uh, as is usually the case for, for me, uh, one person developing the same code on multiple computers. So I have a bunch of code that I want to run on, on different computers or be able to edit from my laptop or from from uh, a work desktop <laughs> computer or from my home desktop or whatever. Um, uh, or uh, be able to back up my code as a, as a, a side to this every time I commit and, and uh, have it um, pushed to a, a central repository somewhere. All that code is saved uh, in case uh, my laptop breaks. Um, but uh, we also just want to avoid this, you know, emailing each other back and forth uh, different versions of a, of, a, of a paper or of a code base or something like that. So this way allows us to easily see uh, what has changed and when uh, and be able to do all the merging of all the different changes behind the scenes. And if any conflict should arise, which hopefully they won't, uh, unless you're both working on the same line of code or the same uh, paragraph or something like that of a, of a paper, um, then we can deal with those merge conflicts as they arrive. Uh, so in a distributed version control system like Git, cloning is a standard operation to get files. So uh, as I mentioned before, you just um, you clone the entire repository onto your local computer uh, into a, a particular folder on your, on your local um, disk. Uh, so as I said, cloning is useful for backups, even when you're not collaborating. Um, in order to clone a repository from somewhere else, uh, you do um, this git clone action. So you do git clone, um, and then the path to the other computer, and then the path to the files uh, containing the repository that you want to clone. And then from now on, uh, you can pull the state of the files from this other computer uh, to the one you're working on now. So if someone makes a change on that other computer uh, and then they commit their changes, you can pull those changes to your local computer uh, to get the latest updated version of that code. Um, so from the computer that you're working on now, do uh, you commit your changes, then do git pull um, from the other computer to the uh, path uh, to your current working um, uh, version. <coughs> so these uh, projects have to be hosted somewhere um, in order for you to be able to communicate with them from anywhere. Um, so because Git is a distributed system with everything being local, uh, in order to be able to push your projects back, any changes that you have made back to uh, uh, a place where other people can access them, you need to be able to uh, use this command push. Uh, so that you can push all of your changes to a central repository somewhere 
um, that people have access to and then can, can pool your changes. Um, and uh, in order to avoid confusion, you only want to push to something called a bare repository. Uh, and the bare repository is just something that has no working copy. It just, it just contains all of the changes that have been made to Git. So it's not a place on someone's computer where they're actively making changes to. Uh, it is just, uh, its sole purpose is to act as a folder containing um, the latest updated version of the code. So you can set up one of these bare repositories on a central server that uh, maybe everyone has SSH access to um, so that they can uh, push and pull to the central server. Um, and, uh, or you can, uh, uh, there are also many free hosting sites if your uh, code is uh, public or open source. Uh, and we'll, um, one of the most popular ones of these is called GitHub, if you guys have heard of that. Uh, and uh, as part of the homework, we'll have you create a, a GitHub repository so you can, you can play around with all this. It is a Git repository, but it has no it has no working file. So it's got it doesn't have a working copy of the lo of the latest changes. No, there's a special way to create a bare repository. Um, you can just I can't remember, but it sounds right. But yeah, and, and that uh, um, yeah. So basically, you just don't want to make any changes of the files in the bare repository. You just want to leave it be. And then the way you communicate with this bare repository is with uh, pushing and pulling. So once you get this bare repository hosted and created on a separate server, you can clone the repository to your local disk. Um, the first action you always want to do is pull, just in case someone has made changes to the repository. And then push any new changes that you have committed on your local repository to the server. So here I'm creating the folder my clone, which is where I want uh, my repository to be. Uh, I do git clone, and then the path to the repository it can be, you know, git at uh, github.com. Codeset no longer exists, sadly. Um, and then the the path to uh, the git repository, uh, and then it will clone all of that uh, information onto your local disk. Then you can make changes to uh, the files in this repository. You know, change a file, then do git commit uh, minus m, uh, long and descriptive commit message. Once again, you pull to update to the latest version of the, uh, of the code, just in case someone has updated um, the code while you were working on your code. This is just a, a safety to prevent merge conflicts. Do git pull. Uh, if there aren't any merge conflicts, you resolve them as necessary. Otherwise, then you can just do uh, git push to push the changes that you have made locally to the central repository so that others can access them. <coughs> so conflicts sometimes arise. Generally, uh, git will happily deal with multiple workers on the same file and merge the changes automatically. Um, if, for instance, uh, Alice was working on line 10 of the code and Bob was working on line uh, 50 of the code and they both made changes to each of those lines and they both committed those changes and then both uh, uh, pushed to the repository, um, then um, Git should be able to merge them correctly as long as they do this uh, are uh, um, good with how they do the, get the pushing and pulling operations. But uh, if the same line is edited by multiple people, human, um, human intervention is required to resolve the conflicts. So say Alice and Bob both tried to uh, edit the same line. Um, one said person one is the best person. One said person two is the best person. Uh, it will create this, uh, this file which uh, has both of the options here, and then you just need to to fix the, mer uh, the merge conflict and then commit the, the corrected version.
so uh, once again, this, this sort of uh, overview of this workflow is just to pull the latest version from the central repository, modify the code and document on your local repository, commit your changes as you make them, pull, uh, again, to uh, resolve any merge conflicts that might have occurred while you were working on your code, and then you can push your changes to the central repository, and then you can repeat. <coughs> um, so, once again, I'll give a, a quick demo of uh, how to do this, this sort of workflow with SmartGit. So I'm going to SSH into my home computer. Ignore all the errors that it tells me. Eh, it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, okay, so I cd it into the uh, the place where my repository is called QRepo, um, and uh, now I want to uh, do git pull. Um, to see if any changes have been made. So we can pretend that I'm another person on my home computer here. Uh, oh, excuse me, I didn't actually push any new changes. So remember before I made changes to my repository uh, on the, the grid plot uh, um, code. Uh, so now I can push these to the central repository so that others can access them. Now if I do git pull on my other computer, it uh, notes that there has been a change to gridplot.py. One file change, one insertion, zero deletions. I can do git log to see what happened. Uh, here we see I added a nice comment. Very nice. So let me make a change on this computer. Um, added another comment. <laughs> I never use that, whatever. Uh, so now I can do git commit gridplot.py minus m. There we go. That is committed. Um, then I can do git pull just in case someone has made changes while I was working on that one file, which nobody should have. Then I do git push. And now back on my laptop, I can go through um, uh, here and do a pool. And uh, let it crunch through. And now I can take a look at the log and see that I actually did add another comment um, on another computer. So if this was someone else, oh, actually, you can see that. I've got two different author names here. Adam N. Morgan is my laptop. Adam Morgan is my uh, desktop at home. So 
th this is like an example of how you can have two different people from, or one person on two different computers collaborating on the same code. Um, right. Any questions about that? So there's a few uh, more complex things that uh, we can get into. I did not have this formatted correctly. Um, so different things that uh, that we can uh, that you can do with Git that I'm not going to go into too much details, but I um, uh, just wanted to let you know that these options are out there. If you want to go back and undo some changes that you've made uh, uh, to um, a particular file, say you've committed something and you screwed up or something, um, uh, you just want to ignore any changes that you've made after a particular commit, you can do that with something called a git reset minus minus hard. Uh, and you need to specify which commit um, you're going back to with uh, the last few digits, or sorry, the first few digits of that uh, uh, sh1 hash that we mentioned before that each of these commits is identified by. Uh, so this reset minus minus hard will load an old commit and delete all commits newer than the one just loaded. So this is a kind of a dangerous thing to do unless you really know what that, that that's what you want. If you want to check out an old version of the code and be able to play with it and uh, uh, see how it ran, uh, you can do git checkout uh, and then specify the first few digits of the hash. And that this will load an old commit, but uh, any new edits will be applied to this, this new commit and uh, will go down a different branch. So um, your other edits that you made after the fact, after this old commit, will still be accessible. Um, and there's this git revert, which say you make a lot of changes to your local repository, but then realize you don't want to do anything with them. Uh, you can just revert, and that'll go back to the, uh, the latest version from the repository. So say you made a bunch of changes and realized, or maybe you made a bunch of changes when you were drunk and you don't want to commit them and let people know that you were drunk when you made those changes, just revert back to the, uh, the old repository. How do you know the uh, first of the hash of some previous version? You can get them from the log. Okay. So if you do git log and then you scroll down to where um, the, and it, if you had nice commit messages, uh, then you could see at what point, okay. You look, yeah, you look at the commit message, or you can look at the, uh, if you do a diff, or if you, if you go back to smart git, you can pull up, if you just double click on that, that, that uh, uh, if you go through the log, it will say all the different commit messages. If you double click on one of those, then it will pull up the, the state of the file as it was at that time. So you can see what the state of the file was. Um, and uh, um, you can go back to that. With smart git, again, it's much easier because you can just say, I want to check out this file, click, and then it will check out that file. Uh, but this is what you do if you want to do it from the command line. Um, there's also branching if you want to take things down a new path, um, uh, but leave a, a, a current uh, um, version of the code as it is and just modify it, but not, not commit that to the same uh, code base over and over again. You can do what's called a branch. Um, and just go down a different path with, with your code. If that may. Um, and say you want to test out a new algorithm, you can, you can switch to a new branch um, and do development on this new algorithm without affecting the other uh, branch of the code, the main one that people are working on. Um, okay. And then after the fact, if you decide that you want to merge that branch back to the main part of the code, you can do so with this merge. I don't really do any of this very often, but uh, um, it's out there. So do they have two different names, or how do you 
Yeah, you give a branch uh, a particular name. Uh, so the master branch is uh, the one that uh, is the main branch for that uh, for that code base. But if you want to um, make a new one for testing purposes or something, you can give it a new name and, and start playing around with that. Uh, so there's uh, lots more that you can do with Git uh, as well. There's also things like uh, you can get help from all the commands. You can browse through all your history, change history if you want. If you want to uh, change the commit message that you've uh, that you made before, you can do that with something called rebase. Um, you can also work with other version control system tools. I used to use uh, Subversion, uh, so all of my uh, code base was uh, version controlled under, under subversion, but Git allows you to take that um, code base and, and import it all within the Git framework. So that was really nice because uh, I wanted to start using Git, but I had already made all these nice commits and had all the history and stuff, and it allowed me to, to take all that from the, uh, the old code base. Uh, there is advanced collaboration features, of which I know nothing about. Um, <laughs> And uh, other things like you can tag a, a, um, a version of your code with a, a particular version number. Um, and there's also some uh, shell script tools that you can use. Uh, so in conclusion with Git, uh, version control is awesome and you all should do it. Uh, Git is a free, actively developed, distributed version control system, which I highly recommend. Um, graphical user interface tools like Smart Git make it even easier to use. Uh, there are online repositories like GitHub, which allow for free backup of your code base and easy collaboration. Although um, it's only free if it's open source, so if there's any code or, say, papers or something like that that you don't want to be publicly accessible, then you probably don't want to use the free version of GitHub. But there are paid options available if you want to store things on the internet. Or you can just set up a server uh, that everyone that's collaborating has access to, and then you can do everything through SSH. And the mantra of pull, modify, commit, pull, push, repeat. <laughs> uh, and here are some uh, um, of links to obtain all this stuff that I mentioned before. This Git Magic book, I think, uh, if you're new to Git, is a, is a great online resource introducing everything. Um, cool. So any uh, questions about Git? We've got, uh, OK. So uh, I'll just uh, go into the homework now. Um, three homework problems here that I've set up. Um, the first one is to go into one of these free hosting, online hosting services, uh, such as GitHub and uh, begin Git version control of your homework for this class. Uh, so you can create one folder for each of your um, homeworks. So you know homework one, homework two, homework three, et cetera. Um, and you can add all the previous homeworks as well. Um, and as you make commits on your local clone, uh, on your laptop or on your desktop, uh, you can push all the changes to the online repository. Um, so from, uh, from now on, or uh, at least for this week, you can turn in your homework for this week by sending an email with us, uh, to us with instructions on how to clone this repository. So create this repository on GitHub uh, uh, and putting all your, your homework files into it for this week and for previous weeks, um, and allow us to uh, clone the repository from GitHub uh, to our local computers. <coughs> Homework number two uh, is to begin version control on one of your own coding projects uh, separate from this class, just so you can start getting in the habit of doing this for your own work. Um, it can be a research code or journal article, a project, thesis, or everything that you do, which is the ideal solution. Uh, you don't need to send this code to us. Just send us a, a, a copy of the Git log so we know that you're actually doing it. Um, and all we'll be looking for here is that you're making uh, a number of commits 
um, and actually are using this for development, uh, just for the goal of uh, continuing on um, using Git in your everyday life or some other version control system. Can you tell them about the, um, the single line uh, sort of summary statement for making, making Git commits, and then also you know, basically using space after that so that they're going to do the longer version of it? So typically, like on GitX, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I use to visualize the branches and converges, you'll see one line which summarizes the log of that change. You don't want to say, like you want to be as descriptive as possible and be sure to uh, fewer number of words as possible. But then typically, if you're being really good about commenting, you'll have a space after that, uh, and then you'll write a longer description of what it is that you actually want to change. Um, but when you're saying descriptive commit messages, we'll be happy if you just make it anything more than I just changed this line. If you say, now this has a new functionality, And then finally, back to the, uh, the arg parse and, and module stuff, uh, we're going to be reusing some of the old co code that uh, you guys had had uh, developed. Uh, was, it, was this the last homework or two homeworks ago? Three homeworks ago? Um, I think it was homework five, um, using the, the database uh, homework. Um, so Chris has uploaded the latest prediction data from Intrade onto BSpace. Um, so you can download this prediction data uh, into the homework folder for this week. So this is, is this homework seven or eight? This is homework eight. Okay, so this is homework eight. Um, so download the latest prediction uh, data into this homework and without moving the base code from your homework five folder. Uh, so leaving all of the, the functional, all the, the modules and stuff that you put in that folder the same. Um, load the necessary functions from that code into a new module for this week's homework folder. Uh, and then uh, set up a parser with arg parse, allowing the user to retrieve information from the database in a user-friendly way. Um, so keep all your homework 5 code in a separate folder. Set it up so that you can import functions and modules from that folder uh, to do the various database stuff that we want. Uh, and then set up an arg parse um, uh, set up so that we can call, say, create a function called election predictions.py, and we can call this from the command line um, minus C Obama minus date March 28th. Uh, would print out uh, Obama's closing value uh, from the prediction date on March 28th. And uh, also include a option minus P or minus minus plot, which will show a plot of all the predicted values from the candidate over time. Uh, with the value at the specified date highlighted on that plot. And just uh, include all the necessary checks to make sure that the user's path is set correctly to import the code so that when we try to run this in our computer that uh, everything will work correctly. Is that clear? Questions on that? Okay, great. <laughs>